Okay, folks, here we are again. A quick run on the experiment to measure the acceleration due to gravity, small g, by the free fall method. This uh, experiment has come up in 2004, 2009, and 2019 in the Leaving Cert Honours paper. It is a fairly straightforward experiment. If you look at those three questions, they're virtually identical, the exact acts, the exact same things. And just because it came up in 2019 doesn't mean it can't make an appearance in 2020. Okay, let's have a quick look at the background of gravity. Well, when we think of gravity and the gravitational force, there are two scientists that we think about in particular. The first is our old friend Isaac Newton. And way back in the 1670s, Isaac Newton said, I know masses attract other masses, but I can't explain why. But I can tell you, I can give you a formula that allows you to calculate the size of the force between any two masses. The size of the force between any two masses is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. That is known as Newton's law of universal gravitation, and that's there on page 56 of your maths tables. Whereas Newton could not explain why gravity occurred, Einstein in the early 20th century said, Newton came up with a great idea, but my way actually explains why masses attract masses. It's all about the curvature of the space-time continuum, and he came up with another set of equations that were actually better to explain reality at very high speeds and very high masses than Newton's. However, in the everyday world around us, Newton's laws of gravitation are quite sufficient to work with. They got people to the moon, they can calculate um, a gravitational fields. They're, they're, quite, they're quite acceptable. Either way, whichever um, idea of gravity is your favorite one, one thing is absolutely certain. When you drop something, it falls. And when an object falls, it doesn't just fall at the same speed. Look at this object here that's been falling. Uh, after one second, after zero seconds, it's not moving, zero meters per second. After one second, it's going 9.8 meters per second. Two seconds, double 9.8. Three seconds, triple 9.8. Four seconds, its speed has gone up to 30, 39.2 meters per second. And after five seconds, 49 meters per second, which is five times 9.8. In other words, the object as it is falling is accelerating. It's accelerating downwards. That acceleration we call acceleration due to gravity or gravitation. Of course, that means there's a force acting on the object because wherever you see acceleration, it's caused by a force and we call that force the gravitational force. Now, what is the rate at which this object picks up speed as it falls? Well, you can see the difference between all those numbers is 9.8 meters per second. So we can say that any object in free fall gets 9.8 meters per second faster every second that it's falling. We're, of course, ignoring air resistance here. So any object in free fall in a gravitational field will accelerate by 9.8 meters per second every second it falls. So we can write that as 9.8 meters per second per second. And that's a very old way of writing it, but still quite acceptable. The more modern way is that g, the acceleration due to gravity, is 9.8 meters per second to the minus 2. In other words, every second that the object is falling, it gets 9.8 meters per second faster. That, of course, is the units of acceleration. Be very, very careful to learn them. That is the acceleration due to gravity. So a quick definition, never really seen it in a leading start paper, but a quick definition of what is the acceleration due to gravity. Well, acceleration due to gravity, small g, is the rate at which an object in free fall gains speed. It's the rate at which it picks up speed. I suppose if you want to be pedantic about it, it really picks up velocity because if it's in free fall, we know the direction that it's going in. I would make sure you learn that definition of acceleration due to gravity and make absolutely sure you know the units of acceleration. Most people know 9.8, 9.81, sometimes in leading start papers. Okay, that is what acceleration due to gravity is. Now, when we're doing the experiment to measure acceleration due to gravity, a little bit of theory first. A little bit of theory is very, very easy, really. 
we used the formula s equals ut plus a half at squared. Now that is one of the um, formulas of motion. You find that formula there on page 50 of your maths tables, s equals ut plus a half at squared. And of course, it's very, very important to understand what each part of this formula means. Well, s is the distance something travels in a particular direction. So I usually call it distance. Theoretically, it's called displacement, proper name for it. Uh, equals the initial velocity, the starting speed of it, multiplied by the time that it's moving, plus a half times the acceleration that it's under by the time that it's moving squared. I'm really fond of that equation because as you can see, it's got a t squared and a t in it. It is a quadratic equation. Of course, if you wanted to solve it, you could use that famous minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac formula over 2a, the, the famous Arab formula to find the times if you really needed it. Now, let's apply this formula to a falling object. Well, here's our falling object. We are going to put our object there. Someone has just thrown that object off a cliff. Let's just apply a few things to it. Well, what's its initial speed? Well, its initial speed before its gravity takes over is zero meters per second. And what acceleration is it under? Well, the acceleration it's under will be g, small g. It will be accelerating downwards at 9.8 meters per second per second. So if we can substitute these two things into that original formula, we're going to get, well, s is the distance something. Well, we'll just write the formula down first. s is the distance that it falls. What's its starting speed? Well, its starting speed is zero, so whatever time makes no difference. Anything multiplied by zero is zero. So we'll put that, leave that blank, it's zero. Plus a half, well, what is the acceleration that it's under? Well, we said the acceleration is um, g, 9.8, we'll call that g by t squared. Now, if you rearrange that formula, get g on its own, you will get g, the acceleration due to gravity, equals twice the distance over the time squared. And that is the formula, that is the formula that we're going to use to actually calculate the acceleration due to gravity. That formula we derived from that one up there. You don't have to show that derivation, but you best remember that because that version, of course, is a special case of that one. And this is not in the maths tables, that one is. So this formula is saying to us, the acceleration due to gravity, the rate at which something picks up speed as it falls, equals twice the distance it falls, divided by the time it takes to fall that distance squared. In other words, if we want to measure the acceleration due to gravity of something that's falling, we measure the distance it falls, the time it takes to fall, double the distance, square the time, do the maths, and when you divide 2s by t squared, the answer you get is the acceleration due to gravity. So that is the formula we're going to use to measure acceleration due to gravity. So instead of measuring acceleration due to gravity, we're measuring distance and time and putting it into that formula. Okay, let's move on. Well, now let's look at the actual experiment. Well, if we look at the actual experiment to measure acceleration due to gravity, here is our experimental setup. Well, we have to have an object that falls, but uh, what I would like to do is, so we will not forget it, just remember the formula we just looked at there is g equals 2s over t squared. The whole purpose of this experiment is to measure g, and we do that by measuring the distance something falls, the time it takes to fall, and applying that formula to it. So here is our object that's going to fall, and this is a metal ball. It can be made of steel, steel can be made of lead. This metal ball is in a release mechanism. Now, when the button on the release mechanism is pushed, the ball, metal ball, is released and it falls. So we often call this the, the start part of the, the equipment. Two things happen when that button is pushed the metal ball starts to fall down and the circuit is broken, electricity is going through the metal ball, so the electronic timer starts. This guy here is.
the metal ball falls. Once the metal ball starts falling, the timer starts. When the metal ball hits this pad here, this is known as a a vibration switch or a vibration pad. And when the metal ball hits that, that stops the electronic timer. So we have the time taken for the metal ball to fall. It's on the electronic timer. We also want to get the distance the metal ball falls. And the distance, be very careful of this. Well, what part of the metal ball actually hits the, the vibration switch first? Well, it's the bottom. So we measure the distance from the bottom of the metal ball down to the top of the vibration switch or the vibration pad, and we call that distance S. Over here, I've got to measure that distance A, meter stick. Very, very handy to have a meter stick in any experiment because there's a whole set of precautions with that about parallax and zero error that you can use if you're asked questions about how to make the experiment more accurate. So that's our diagram there. The things that I would like to caution people about are make sure it's a metal ball so that when you press the switch, the timer actually starts and that the distance is measured from the bottom of the metal ball to the top of the vibration pad there, the bottom of the metal ball, because that's what hits that first. Okay, well, of course, if you were asked about this experiment, you might be asked, how did this data get recorded? How did you measure this data? Well, it's quite easy to say the distance is measured with a meter stick, but how exactly was the uh, time measured? Well, you have to put a few words there into a couple of sentences, and it's really, really quite easy. First of all, you measure the distance, S, and make sure you show it in the diagram with a meter stick. Then you measure the time, T, with electronic timer. You wouldn't do this once, you try to do this for about six different heights. So you keep adjusting the height and do this for about six different corresponding values of distance and time. At that stage, you could do, you could uh, apply two ways, two ways you could do this. You could say G equals 2S over T squared for each of your results and get an average. But in leaving cert honors, they will expect you to plot a graph. Now, what graph would have a slope of 2S over T squared? Well, remember, the slope of any graph is something um, that's on the y-axis divided by what's on the x-axis. So this, if you plot 2S on the y-axis and T squared on the x-axis, the slope of that graph will be Ts over T squared, 2S over T squared, which is, is G. Remember, 2S is in meters, twice the distance is in meters. Time is measured in seconds, so time squared is measured in a unit called seconds squared. And the slope of this graph, well, the slope of any graph is y over x. What's on the y-axis of this graph? 2s. What's on the x-axis? t squared. And we've already said several times that 2s over t squared is the acceleration due to gravity g. <coughs> okay, you'll obviously have to get the slope of the graph if you drew it by taking two points, not naught, and another point up there using the formula m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Always write that formula down if you use it. <coughs> okay, that's the diagram. That's the procedure to measure to actually get the, the, the different things you need to put into the formula. And you need to know both of those and be able to write them down. The next thing you will need, and they often ask these, if you look at the three questions I talked about uh, earlier, 2004, 2009, 2019, they will ask you some precautions to make your final answer more accurate. Well, the precautions here are very, very easy. You've seen these so often, you must be sick of them. Avoid error of parallax when using a meter stick. Always a good idea to say, what did you do? You look straight down at the scale of the meter stick to avoid that. You make sure there's no zero error on your meter stick that it reads zero when it's meant to read zero, and a way around that is getting a new meter stick. You must measure the distances in this experiment to the bottom, from the bottom of the metal ball to the vibration switch, and um, a lot of people say the center of gravity. No, it's not the center of gravity that stops the clock, so you must measure to the bottom of the, the metal ball. Now, this is an interesting one. For each height, record the time three times. And a lot of people say then take the average. No, you don't. You take the lowest time. 
Now pay attention to this because this is an interesting one. If you carry this experiment out and let's say your height is exactly one meter and you drop the ball and you get a certain time. Well, if you do it three times for one meter and you get three separate, very close values, but not exactly the same, which would you take? Well, the temptation is to average them, but that's wrong because you always take the lowest because lots of things can make the time longer than it should be. Friction in the release mechanism, a little gust of wind blowing the ball slightly diagonally rather than straight down will increase the time, but nothing can reduce the time. So you always, you do the experiment three times, take three different time values for each height and take the lowest one. Uh, another very good precaution, and listen to this carefully, you don't use exceptionally small distances. Normally you don't use distances less than about 0 0.3 meters. Why? Because with small distances, you will this will lead to very um, high percentage errors. Okay, small values lead to high percentage errors. If the distance is small, so will the time, and that will lead to high percentage errors. Um, another one, exclude any drafts, exclude any drafts or wind, make sure the window is closed because any drafts or wind can cause the ball to go not directly down but at an angle and that would increase the time and that would be an inaccuracy into the experiment. So exclude any drafts or wind. Uh, a question they asked once in this experiment, um, I can't remember when, it was many years ago, how is air resistance minimized? Um, well, there's two ways of minimizing air resistance in this experiment. Use a lead ball, um, a ball, a sphere will have less air resistance. Okay, um, maybe it would be better to actually make absolutely sure we're talking a sphere there, but I can't imagine ball and sphere would have too many different meanings in this, or uh, would be that different in this context. Either way, a sphere will have less air resistance. And another way of minimizing air resistance would be get rid of it totally, do the experiment in a vacuum. I think I showed you a nice video of um, Professor Brian Cox in America in a vacuum chamber, dropping a bowling ball and a feather at the same time, and they both accelerated down at the exact same rate in the absence of air resistance. Nice little one there. Okay, you need to learn those. Again, I'm gonna make the point, if you're asked for two precautions in this experiment, make sure you give three, not four, not five, three. Okay, next little bit. Now we'll have a little quick look at an actual leaving cert question. This is from a way back 2004. And the 2004 leaving cert question says, in an experiment to measure the acceleration of gravity by free fall method, a student measured the time t for an object to fall from rest, starts at rest, through a distance s. The procedure was repeated for a certain uh, series of values. And you notice, the first thing you notice there is the distance is given in centimeters. Well, the first thing you would have to do is change all those to meters. Okay. And then you notice the time is given in milliseconds. A millisecond is a thousandth of a second. And you'll have to convert all those to seconds by dividing by a thousandth. Now, describe with the aid of a diagram how the student obtained the data. Well, that's the label diagram, but you would also have to explain how the student obtained the time. Okay, label diagram is easy. Uh, how did they get the distance value, meter stick, that's included in the diagram, but sometimes they want a little bit more of an explanation of how the student obtained the time. So here is my way of obtaining the time. How was the time measured? The timer starts when the ball falls. The timer stops when the ball hits the vibration pad. And the time on the timer, on the electronic timer, is the time that you want. I think you would need to spell out exactly how the time was measured by doing it this way, by explaining it this way, if you were asked a question like that. In 2009, they asked how was the time measured. In 2004 and 2019, they said, how did the student obtain the data? But you would have to explain, in addition to your label diagram, how the time was measured. The timer starts when the ball falls, the timer stops when the ball hits the vibration pad, and what's written on the electronic timer then is the time 
that you see there in the question. <coughs> okay, next part, calculate a value for the acceleration due to gravity by drawing a suitable graph. This is where you need to know the shape of the graph because you do not plot distance against time. You plot twice the distance against the time squared and get your straight line graph then. So here is the graph you would be expected to plot. <coughs> the graph is twice distance against time squared. Obviously you put in the appropriate units. Distance is measured in meters, twice distance still in meters. Time is measured in seconds, but time squared is measured in seconds squared. And the slope of this graph is y over x, which is 2s over t squared, because on the y-axis you've got 2s, on the x-axis you've got t squared, and as we said several times, ts over 2s over t squared is the acceleration due to gravity g that we're looking for. Obviously, when you're actually doing this experiment, make sure the graph goes through it or not. Take another point up there. This will be x1, y1. This will be point x2, y2. And always write down the formula to calculate slope. Slope equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. There's marks for that. The last little bit there was give two precautions that should be taken to ensure a more accurate result. Well, as I've said to you several, several times, if you're asked for two precautions, make sure you give three precautions. And those precautions are the ones that I think we've seen enough of at this stage, but we'll have another quick look at them. You make sure that you avoid error of parallax when using a meter stick and say why or how you do this by looking By looking straight down the scale, make sure there's no zero error in the meter stick. Measure all distances from the bottom of the metal ball. For each height, record the time three times and take the lowest, not the average. And don't use very small distances as these lead to very small times and high percentage errors. No drafts or wind. Okay, drafts are two precautions, give three. Very important to do that. Okay, uh, a very, 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 very quick look. A very quick look now at the 2009 question. Just a very, very quick look. <coughs> in an experiment to determine the acceleration due to gravity, the time t for an object to fall from rest, from rest through a distance s was measured exactly the same as the question we've looked at already. The procedure was repeated for a series of values of s. The following were recorded. Again, you're given distance in centimeters. You will have to bring that to meters and 30 centimeters is 0 0.30 meters. 40 centimeters is 0 0.04 meters. <coughs> and the time is given in milliseconds. You'll have to divide that by 1,000 to bring it to seconds. 285. Draw a label diagram of the apparatus. Should be able to do that. Between which points was the distance S measured? Well, that's from the bottom of the ball to the vibration pad, but you show that on your diagram. Explain, describe how the time t was measured. Well, what did I say there? When the ball falls, the timer starts. When the ball hits the vibration pad, the timer stops. Read the time on the timer. <coughs> Draw the suitable graph. The key point there is suitable graph. And that is uh, 2s against t squared. And the slope of that is g. Uh, a small dense ball was used as the object that falls. Stated advantage of using this type of ball. Well, if you're asked to state an advantage, try to give two advantages. One advantage would be that um, the ball would have low air resistance. Okay, and that would be the main one. Second one there, um, <coughs> it says dense, so I presume that cuts through the air better. Uh, that would be, I think... Low air resistance is the, is the best answer there. Okay, thank you. I hope this was some help to you. Good night.